nice. I love the the diverse range of people that are involved in this group. It's so interesting. I, I wish I could talk to you guys all day. Um, we were literally just saying in the other call, it's a kind of global, like multi. Yeah, it's amazing. Cool. I guess um, maybe we'll crack on just in terms of time. I have so many things that I was keen to talk to you guys about today. I don't know, James, is, or does anyone want to do any, is there any introductory bits or shall I just jump straight in? Uh, jump straight in. Um, yeah, welcome to Zero Friday Sessions. Yeah, that's it, really. Yeah, just go. Um, I think it's a short presentation and then we'll go into Q&A. Yeah, I'm keen to uh, to have a discussion and, and hear your guys' views. I think for context, my name's Chloe and I'm presenting today on behalf of two organisations that um, we are leading. So there's Material Research Limited, which is really much more focused on the materials and then Natural Building Systems, which is looking at how do you take natural and bio-based materials and how do you incorporate that into sustainable uh, approaches to construction? So I've got a lot I want to cover today. I am conscious of time, so I will probably talk quite quickly and whistle through the slides in the hope that we can then get to talking about the bits that you guys are most interested in. I will caveat it by saying my background is not as a construction professional per se. I'm not a material scientist. I We work with a fantastic material scientist uh, and engineers, etc. Um, so I am very much giving you my uh, overview and understanding and I'm happy to be challenged on any of it. So um, I guess I'll just jump straight in. Some of these slides I think you guys might have seen before. Is it all working OK from a tech perspective? You can see the slides and stuff. Yeah, perfect. Yep. So just to set the context, this uh, is showing the overall greenhouse emissions of the UK over the last 30 years. And, and the, the idea is to try and start on a positive note and show that overall the trend is heading in the right direction. But obviously, when you look at construction, actually, the line is heading in the other direction. So the green line is if we were following uh, if we were following the annual um, targets for, for greenhouse gas reduction, the red line is actually what's happening. And part of my um, theories as to why this is happening is because increasingly we're looking at the operational efficiencies of buildings and in order to increase that we have to use more insulation materials and that means uh, potentially putting more upfront embodied carbon into buildings in order to save over the lifetime of the building. So there's obviously something's not quite right in construction and I think in the insulation market in particular this is very apparent. So this is just a summary of a piece of research that was done by the EU Joint Research Centre on the uh, global building thermal insulation market. And not to, I could talk about it all day, but the, the summary is that the economies of scale are really missing for innovative and low carbon construction materials. Overall, they determine the uh, insulation market to be very stagnant um, with low chance of innovation getting off the ground. Um, and that's really, I think, the context for the conversation today, because in order to achieve um, zero carbon construction, the materials that we're using are going to be a key part of that. Again, this slide, I think, just really shows uh, kind of underpins that graph in construction terms, in terms of as we've been trying to increase the operational efficiency of buildings, we're seeing more and more insulation being used, but that insulation tends to be traditional plastic foams, PIR, et cetera, and uh, wool insulation. And when it says wool, it's referring to glass and mineral wool fiber insulation, not sheep's wool insulation. And all biomaterials are kind of wrapped up in this other insulation category, which you can see makes up a, a tiny portion of the larger pie. And I think the point here is that I think this is uh, in some ways it's understandable because we're looking at U values and thermal performance in a kind of narrow frame. But actually, these natural materials typically have a much wider performance characteristics. So they can store, you know, a flexible wood fibre, for example, can store six to 12 times the amount of heat than a mineral or glass fibre would. You've got these kind of low density synthetic insulations that whilst they have a really the low thermal conductivity, they don't necessarily have the density or the thermal mass to create a stable internal environment. And that leads to problems with things like uh, overheating in summer, etc. 
So really what we're all about is, is trying to focus on, on those natural materials. And again, just setting the context, this slide is looking at the uh, share of embodied versus operational carbon over the next 20, 30 years in terms of the footprint of construction. And what you can see is as we achieve grid decarbonisation and as we achieve better design and performance of buildings, the actual embodied carbon becomes much more consequential and makes up a larger part of the pie. So that is all really just setting the scene for why we think this stuff is important. Um, the challenge is that when you are using what are deemed to be kind of more sustainable and low carbon materials, it tends to be on kind of one off um, niche projects, usually either very nicely architecturally designed. And at the other end of the spectrum, you've got the scaled um, development of off-site fabrication, which is more efficient and creates buildings um, in a more efficient way, but isn't necessarily um, reducing any of those high embodied carbon materials that are being used. So what's our solution and, and what are we here to talk about today? Well, we are just one example of an SME that is trying to innovate in this space. And I think that we have a concept that we are really proud of and materials that we are working on, and we are grappling with the challenges of how do we scale what we're doing? And I hope that some of the lessons that we're grappling with, I know I'm sure that other people who are working in this space are also grappling with. Um, so our company was originally created uh, natural building systems to develop a low carbon construction system. And in trying to do this, we were really all about trying to avoid high embodied carbon and particularly petrochemical based ingredients wherever we could. And that's led us down a whole avenue of exploring the actual material side of um, construction and really questioning kind of why and, and what materials we should be using. And in the course of that, we've developed our own composite. Are you, are you all hearing me okay? Yes. Okay. Yep. okay. Um, I can't see you guys because my screen's on presentation view, but so um, we've developed uh, material research, which is uh, taking forward this material work, really. And, and that's what I wanted to um, kind of introduce you to today. So hemp sill is where this all started. And hemp sill is a, an alternative to hemp lime, which has been used in construction for quite some time. But hemp lime is, again, it's not really considered for larger scale developments because the process can be quite um, time and energy intensive. So typically you have to put a lot of water and uh, lime in, and then you have to extract that water. And that can take upwards of six months plus. Um, and so we approached an expert in hemp lime to uh, develop this idea and to work with him. And, and we've now got this composite that we're working with, which takes the lime and the water out and replaces it with an alternative binder. So it creates a material that can retain the performance criteria and, 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 and stuff of hemp and hemp lime, but it is also has a lower carbon footprint and a lower density and therefore a lower thermal conductivity as well. And I think um, hemp is quite a unique material in this space. I'm just going to tell you a little bit about it and why in particular we think it should be used more in construction, not just in our own material, but um, hemp lime and, and other forms of hemp materials more widely. And part of that is because it is such a, an amazing environmental asset. So a hectare of hemp can sequester over 14 tonnes of CO2 and lots of other crops actually, for example, maize by comparison would emit 10 tonnes of CO2 per hectare. So it, it's a really efficient method of carbon capture and that's partly because it's a short cycle crop. So other short cycle crops that we think could also be used in construction are things like straw, flax, uh, you know, there are other products that are efficient at capturing carbon and can be made into construction materials. But hemp in particular is uh, really efficient in this space. And obviously it has a wide range of uses, so it can go into textiles, oils, cosmetics and seeds. Um, and that's kind of where we've come from. Um, my background was actually in the kind of farming world. That's how I originally came to this project. Why is it a superior construction material? Well, it has this uh, actually on the previous slide. It has this unique pore structure you can see in these little images here where it basically has the ability to absorb and desorb water vapour and moisture. And what that means is that it's breathable, it's vapour open. So 
uh, it also has this very convenient feature where it maintains the humidity, relative humidity in the building between 40 and 60 percent. And this happens to be the optimum kind of humidity range for human inhabitants and to uh, reduce the chances of mold and you know, bacteria and other things that like high moisture environments. And because it has this ability to absorb and desorb moisture, this gives it an added thermal characteristic. That means it has a thermal mass many times greater than its actual mass. And this helps it to have what we what is known as a low decrement factor. But but effectively, it means there's a much reduced risk of summer and improved thermal performance. So that's kind of why hemp and other biomaterials we think are an area worth exploring. There's lots of innovation happening in this space, and, and I'm sure you guys probably know of more than me. Obviously, there are things like mycelium based insulation materials and other biomaterials that are being developed. And then in terms of other material innovations, there are more high performing phase change materials, you know, things like aerogels, which are much more at the scientific end of the spectrum. But what we're doing is trying to kind of maximize uh, the performance of, of the materials that we use and use low carbon bio-based materials wherever possible. One thing I wanted to also uh, just tell you a little bit about as an example of another um, invention that material research is working on is uh, mylofoam. So mylofoam is a, a low carbon mineral substitute for PIR insulation and uh, it's completely non-combustible, which is why we think it is uh, so game changing. Obviously, you will all know that post the restrictions in use of flammable materials um, have stopped not only PIR and other flammable materials, but also bio-based materials being used in any buildings above 18 metres. And I think that um, being able to solve the challenges of how we deal with the need for efficient insulation without needing to use flammable um, and toxic PIR, uh, that's obviously a really big challenge for the industry at large. So just bringing it back to the, uh, the five, anal five forces analysis of the insulation market, we believe that the material like mylofoam, I think it's much more clear cut in terms of it could act as a direct substitute for um, PIR and it can be manufactured in a very similar way. So uh, we think that it is something that could be adopted and therefore have a low changeover cost for the existing manufacturers. Uh, obviously, within the installation industry, there's quite a low bargaining power of um, producers because there's so relatively limited choices. But we think that because mylofoam is a, uh, an, a direct replacement, there's much more potential there and it can perform just the same. So I think in terms of timings, I guess I'll probably finish off just by summarising in terms of what we feel the challenges are in scaling innovative low carbon construction materials. We, I guess, see that one of the biggest challenges is thinking through the wider performance characteristics of, of materials that we're using right at the beginning of when a building is being designed. So thinking about things that go beyond just U values to think about air quality, thermal comfort, and crucially, what happens to those materials at the end of life. There's this assumption with bio-based materials that you know they're not going to have as long a lifespan and I think that's something that we really need to challenge because it is linked to moisture and humidity. If we can maintain relative humidity it means the materials are less likely to degrade and things like this. But ultimately I guess my uh, and I'm sure you're all on board the industry generally needs brave early adopters who are less risk adverse and more willing to take a new material and really test it out and and also for investors to be willing to invest in materials that require um, development and research and overall to really look at values that are just beyond cost to also look at the carbon footprint and the environmental impact of alternatives. I know I'm very much preaching to the choir so I'd love to kind of open it up for questions and also uh, get your ideas. Oh and there is one other one last thing I, I just saw today there's a report out um, I think also in this space it's about identifying the quick wins. I saw a report out today that show uh, that is showing that paint is the largest source of microplastic 
pollution in the ocean and waterways, uh, which outweighs all other sources of microplastics like textile fibres and, and whatever else. And, you know, that that's such a, a simple thing. It's not even the materials in the buildings itself. It's just literally the coat that we put on it. And so I guess it's just, uh, yeah, think about your paints and your insulation materials. <laughs> Great. That's me. Thank you, Chloe. Yeah, that, there's a lot, um, a lot of topics covered there, and even even things that we talked about just just then, Rod, as well, about barriers and opportunities, and the innovation cycle that you you can find so find yourself locked in that you, that projects don't want to necessarily take the risk, and then you're locked in a cycle of not being able to scale. You so you are scaling. So uh, quick question, um, why are projects choosing you? Like, what, what, what happens? Is it just a champion with an organisation who says, yes, we, we just want lower carbon? Is it, is it, Absolutely. So? I think there's a big challenge. You know, even architects coming out of universities and people who are designing these buildings aren't able, aren't given sufficient understanding of how these kind of complex issues are yeah can be dealt with and so the the everyone's drawn to just doing things the way that they have always been done and I think it really takes at least one person within an organization to kind of put their head above the parapet and kind of call for things to be done differently we've had some really exciting projects where we had a champion within an organization and then that person leaves for whatever reason and then you're kind of left trying to kind of start start again in convincing people that what you're doing is worth worth trying and that can be really challenging but obviously everyone involved in in this network is the kinds of people that do get this stuff and why it's important so i just encourage you all to try and challenge your own organizations and champion um innovative solutions that you find um out there and and give them a go I think, I mean, just further to that, it's astonishing how many architects and designers we speak to because the client wants us to use our products and the architects and designers who you think should know these things. And they it's almost like we're telling them things that they've never heard before. And I find it so astonishing to talk to these people. Um, and, and these are the people who should be promoting lower carbon materials and lower carbon projects and, and they're not. I think just to say in this space, you know, there is absolutely value in looking at how do we improve the materials that we are used to working with? How do we improve concrete and steel? And, you know, that's a really key part of it, certainly when you're looking at more um, industrial scale projects. But I think that, um, you know, even within residential uh, new build developments, there's huge potential to be using more of these bio based, uh, you know, effectively, these materials are capturing the carbon and locking it up in those materials for the lifetime of the building versus emitting lots of carbon while you're producing the materials. It just seems like such a no brainer. And as Tasha says, the, the fact that the, even the people designing and specifying these buildings have a, a very kind of quite often a very surface level grasp of like what is embodied versus operational carbon. Like it's quite shocking, really. So, so Chloe. Sorry, Rod. Yeah. Sorry. Hi, Chloe. Rod, <clears throat> Rod here. Um, in terms of um, take up, um, quite an, quite interested to understand if there's been some examples. What sort of take up have we had um, with this uh, technology or new material? Well, it's not new material, but this material. Um, yeah, I mean, I think kind of widening it out. So um, our modular construction system has been two years of very early stage R and D, and we're now doing commercial projects. We're very excited. To be doing uh, an exhibition at Digital Construction Week with the Zero Construct guys in a couple of weeks, um, but we've got uh, luckily as well we've been uh, we've secured funding to do a demonstration project, and I think it requires that investment and particularly funders to be willing to also support because seeing is believing, right? We need to be able to show someone like this is a physical building and this is how it looks and feels and get them inside of it to be able to convince them to take that leap and to, to try a new technology. I think in terms of the materials in the wider sense, I know that there is a real increase in interest in materials like hemp lime, for example, uh, but just anecdotally, like uh, some guys who are running a company that's importing and, and distributing hemp blocks within the UK, they went to a retrofit conference and they were opposite a stool where they were uh, uh, selling or promoting like polystyrene and EPS based 
bricks and they said the amount of people that were drawn to this plastic brick solution just because it's what they know and what they're familiar with versus people willing to kind of go oh, what is this different thing I've never come across I think that you know it their their business is growing and interest is there but it, there is just such a kind of incumbent tendency to just stick to what you know and that's I think the biggest challenge. Sorry the the interesting thing from my perspective is that you've taken a line that we're um, coordinate we're, we're, we're following and that is it's not just about sustainability you've given examples there of how the the uh, the, the use of the material is from a, a, a safety point of view is is also uh, very relevant and also when you were talking about the the breathing buildings and the the uh, the, the health side of things and also operationally so it, it means that we've got a triple whammy there where if we're using materials and we know where those materials are and how they need to be maintained then it means that we're, we're getting not just the sustainability answer but others as well. Absolutely. And I think the circular economy movement is a really key driver in that space, because not only is it about finding solutions that or products that can be reused. And I, I imagine, you know, your tools that is about kind of attaching data to to built environment assets and things would, would be really useful. But I think it just gets people thinking about that end of life thing a bit more, even if what they're working with isn't a circular product per se. You know, actually, that whole uh, approach and methodology, you start to think about, OK, where is this going to go at its end of life? And and that's, I think, also a, a really big part of it. And we're very um, because we're using digital technologies with our modular system. We're very keen on basically bringing that technology space together with the biomaterials and creating digital twins and, and attaching carbon information to that so that you can really kind of have that picture completed rather than we're very conscious about being pigeonholed as a kind of hippie you know your house is made out of weed type solution because that's not what this is about and I think that that's also where the industry struggles in kind of it's quite skeptical I guess um, which you can understand sometimes but yeah if you, if you can show that you've got something there that's non-combustible that's really significant isn't it Certainly in terms of, P I mean, PIR, most uh, most smoke related deaths are from uh, in, inhaling cyanide, which, you know, hydrogen cyanide is released when PIR burns and, and it's it's derived from petrochemicals. So it's highly combustible. So, you know, it just seems nonsensical to be filling our buildings with materials like this. And although we have a, an alternative solution, there are lots of other people innovating in this space. It's just getting the uptake. And, and to be honest, the biggest challenge is, is scaling the manufacturing in the UK. Like we want to use UK hemp because of, we want it to be locally sourced. We want it to be low carbon. There is no supply chain. It's I consider it a really significant opportunity for for decarbonizing agriculture, generating new revenue streams for farmers and enabling low carbon construction. But just it's not people aren't investing in that space yet. I'm, it's coming. I'm, I'm sure it will. But. Any other questions or comments? We've got one minute, so I guess um, if not, I'm happy for us to leave it there. It's been really great to talk to you all and we're really keen to collaborate. Our, our model is definitely to work with others and to we're not about taking on individual projects ourselves. We want to be working with designers and architects and specifiers and, and you know, trying to bring together the, the different elements of construction to work together more, which is obviously what the Zero Group is all about. So, yeah, really pleased to be involved. And if you have any ideas or feedback or criticisms or whatever, then please do reach out. Um, my email should be on the calendar invite and stuff. So I'll certainly be in touch, Chloe. Great. Fantastic. That, Chloe, that was fantastic. And Char, I was expecting you to make a comment about operational versus not versus or compl complementary thinking around operational versus embodied carbon. I, I, well, yeah. I was enjoying my wine, but anyway. Um, <laughs> well, thank you very much. It was a very good um, presentation. I learned a lot. Uh, from me, uh, I'm finance. I'm uh, partially a real estate developer, partially a go, 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 um, net zero advocate. And uh, bio-based insulation, I love insulation. But um, you touched upon so many uh, wonderful aspects of uh, what you're doing there. 
from, from a building standpoint, I'm just interested in is uh, what is the U value and how, how thick is this insulation? Because that's the, you know, the first concern that I have when I tell the architects I want, you know, a very high performing envelope. Right to drive down the operational carbon. Uh, you are also addressing in body carbon, which is fantastic. So um, if you have any specs on that, that would be really helpful for, you know, builders and architects to kind of chew into and the engineers. Right. So um, how thick is an insulation? What form does it come in? Right. Um, are they boards? Do you spray it on? Right. Uh, do they come in rolls? You know, these are just the practical things as to how do I get it installed into the walls or into the roofs, right? And what's the U value, period. Absolutely. And I think the thing is, uh, with our materials, all of those are possible and we're keen to explore lots of different avenues for how they might be applied. I think too, too, uh, many, cho too many choices uh, confuse. Well, right? what, uh, we, what we actually need. Just choose on one, which is the easiest for you and say, we, we give it to you and, you know, um, boards that are 25 yeah. millimeters or 25 I mean, centimeters. boards and blocks for our hemp materials outside of our modular system boards and blocks are the most obvious applications but finding manufacturing partners we don't we don't want to have to start from scratch we want to collaborate and work with others so finding people that you are don't, manufacturing. you don't have manufacturing of the boards yet is no, the boards saying? aren't. Uh, there's no there's no manufacturing partners we've been able to find in the UK. Um, we are obviously open to looking. But further. you don't. Have, you you also mentioned that you don't have hemp in the UK. There's very little hemp, even though it's well suited and has a long history of being grown in here. Hemp sources in Asia. Asia is a really big uh, area for hemp growing, and as is uh, Southern Europe and uh, even America with their industrial bill, that one of the probably only good things that, in my opinion, Donald Trump may have done is uh, to legalize industrial hemp in America. So there's a big kind of boom in that industry happening over there. And so I'm sure that the UK will follow. And when it does, we're kind of primed and ready. But um, up until now, we are still at that kind of early stage of having having a, a really innovative solution, but not being able to get to the scale that, uh, that we want to be at. So, and just one last thing on your, I guess my point about uh, these biomaterials is that the value that they bring is so much broader than new values and i think that that's part of the challenge is conventionally we all think about u values because that's what correlates to operational efficiency when i i, I agree with you I'm, yeah. I'm, and, you, and you explained a lot of those values i just wanted to bring it home mm -hmm. to like you know, if you want to connect with the money yeah, and the absolutely. architect they yeah, do yeah, sure. know yeah, value it's probably worth mentioning our, our our modular system is a uh, is uh, 0.13 U values. It's it's like we're aiming for passive house levels of insulation without needing a uh, huge wall build up. But yeah, it's all we we can actually vary it depending on the scale and size of the building as well. So I see. Well, all better than 0.13. We can go to 0.1. You're into modular modular housing. Yeah, that's how it, this all started. Natural Building Systems is a, a modular bio-based system. I mean, I'll be happy to take it offline. We can have a have a separate chat about that. Oh, yeah, that would be great. Great. Modular are bigger buildings than how. Yeah, yeah, big. yeah. Big, big. Mm -hmm. We like them big in here in Asia. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. That's Thank you, James. Fantastic. Yeah, no, no problem. It sounds like you, you, you both could talk for a few hours on that. So that's that's great. And and one really quick one here. The education piece is quite interesting for those of us who've been out of education or, or secondary and tertiary education for a while. It's always interesting to hear that this isn't front and centre. So maybe we can talk about that at, at, on a later session and talk about education and why that's not happening. But they're yeah. desperate they're desperate for people to go in and talk to students about these things both we've been approached by both technical vocational like practical like on-site building trade skills who are just desperate for some slightly different more innovative inputs and also architects and you know university level i think anyone who's willing to go out there and share the news and talk about these things i think that's you know they are the future workforce in construction and getting them familiar and confident in this kind of language and space is really crucial so that's another thing we can do sure rod kind of build in the education piece and also building the business case and changing perception and breaking that innovation cycle there's a lot lot of work there. um yeah there's loads yeah. of things out there thanks chloe uh, any other questions before we close up 
support. I just can I quickly say, Julian, on your point, I we do talk to we work with some architects who are amazing, and I am my background is in architecture as well, so I'm not completely um, kind of saying they're rubbish, but we definitely speak to some who uh, don't know kind of anything about it. But yeah, no, we do work with some amazing architects. Cool. Great, lovely to meet you all. Thanks so much. Cheers. Brilliant. Good night. Good night for those of us. Yeah, that, that side of the world. And um, yeah, brilliant. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you. Thanks very much. See you later. Cheers. Bye. Bye.